Uh, all right, everyone, welcome to another, I guess, Why Shorts Meta Talk. We actually have a special guest today. I'm still joined with Dean and Nico, but um, also here for the first time ever is Yue. You want to say hi, Yue? Hi, what's up? I'm a strict, uh, Yue, the Penguin420 on Discords. I own Strictly Broken TCG. Phew! Yeah, yeah, are you the best Canadian player also, or are you going to give um, it to someone else? I, I'm, uh, I think I'm just the best player, man. What can I say? <laughs> Ooh, I like it. I like it. <laughs> um, so today we're just going to have, we have like four topics we're going to discuss that we think would be fun. So uh, the first thing we're going to just talk about is uh, UA's Texas run for his team. We'll kind of keep that somewhat relatively short. He can talk about his experiences in Texas. And then we'll talk about the new set, Review Starlight, in English. Uh, all of us here have played it or played against it. So um, we'll just talk about our opinions about the set and how we think it'll affect English. After that, we have, uh, we're have we going to have a discussion with Yue, since he's the best player in the world, on how to become a good player. Uh, you know, <laughs> thing, you know, <laughs> things, the things that uh, good players like consistently do that make them uh, better than like your average anime scrub lord. And then finally, the very good spicy topic is we'll t we're going to be talking about English exclusives at the end of this, and I'm sure that'll be a really good shit show. <laughs> so yeah, uh, we'll just get into the first topic. Um, basically, everyone on, on at least, at least I hope so, everyone on this channel has already heard our tournament report. So you just want to break down how your tournament series went in Texas and how you won everything? You way? Um, all right. Well, I'll... I'll... I'm gonna keep this like super short. Uh, we played. Tom played AOT. Alex played eight gate build, the same similar build that the world champion won from last year. And I played Revy Starlight. Uh, going into it, we just wanted to play the two best decks that we think are the two best decks. Uh, they just we wanted to put me on a deck that can just like be really good against good players and everyone's pretty decent but we thought, we thought Revy was a good choice because I just, I just wanted to soul rush good players in top eight and cheese win was that in swiss i would not do that great or if i did great it would be like kind of lucky even in top eight uh the good players in top eight uh kind of drop poorly which actually happened in the final that i don't, I don't that was pretty funny yeah the, um, I, I didn't think it was very funny but i mean <laughs> Well, it's funny because it actually happened to work out that way. The game wasn't funny. Yeah, so I played uh, yeah. <laughs> hosts in the finals because we, we burst in the finals, right? And um, uh, I guess the review deck did what it was intended to do. Is like if opponent draws bad and opens out a lot of climaxes, then I'm just going to steamroll the game. And it's kind of free because, you know, when good players good play good players, it's kind of like a coin toss who wins sometimes or who's playing the better deck. So I just wanted a deck that kind of capitalizes on when people... Uh, draw bad so they can't really have a chance to play well right yeah that was our plan for the tournament it ended up working exactly how it planned i lost a lot of games in swiss though my record was like two three or three two in swiss i'm losing top eight so that was kind of cool. wait how many losses um, did you get in top eight I'm losing top eight. Oh man you uh, keep kind of like cutting out a little bit i think maybe your sensitivity or something's not just right so i didn't yeah. i didn't drop any games in top eight oh, okay uh, yeah, I think I think our team spread was good. I, I actually watched your guys' uh, tier list to keep updated uh, a little while back, and you guys didn't put AOT up there, but we thought it was good, so that's why we played it. Yeah. And Konosuba, I think everyone unanimously thinks Konosuba is good right now. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that, I guess that's it for the tournament. Uh, specific rounds, I don't actually remember. I don't remember because in Swiss, I'm just thinking about <laughs> trying to soul rush people. <laughs> I actually don't even remember what I, I played Broderick round one and it was pretty funny because same thing happened like in the finals who was out of time. So I rushed him to two, two, three when I was zero. Oh man, killing off your own sponsored players. <laughs> actually, yeah, Broderick, sponsored player. Good player. Check him out. Um, but um, yeah, that's it. That's it. That's it for the tournament. Our strategy worked out. All right. Quite yeah. nicely, actually. Uh, undefeated, actually. So shout out to him. And then Alex only dropped one game all day. So. Those two are pretty on fire too. Oh yeah, yeah. that's good. Um, really quick, you said you think AOT and Konosuba are the two best decks currently in the format. I think so. Okay, yeah, because I think we basically kind of had the same game plan because uh, we already agreed that Dean was going to be playing Tuskaya in Texas yeah. a long time ago. 
So we just put ourselves on what we thought the two best decks in the format were. Um, well, like yeah, Nico wasn't going to play Konosuba. I think Konosuba would probably be better than Bang Dream. You think? Yeah, so, I, th- I think Konos- Yeah, I think Konosuba overall is a better deck than Bang Dream right now. Yeah, but so, I also don't know Konosuba, and I've never played it, so I didn't want to really YOLO it. Yeah, but so Yue, what do you think is like if you had to pick one deck right now? What what is the best deck in the format for when the Texas Regional happen? Uh, for the Texas Regional to happen. Okay, so I always think that long as people don't think AOT is really strong, AOT can win the tournament. And that's why I think it's the best deck because you can go into it. Opponents are trying to win field at one and then you can get your reverse off. Mm-hmm. And then if you're having like the, the, you know, the somewhat decent, you draw win game and you draw second win or something, you just really have a good time steamrolling people. So I think like the best deck going into the tournament is attack on Titan. Uh, flip side, it's really close between like that the bank dream konosuba sunshine right yeah um but i think i i personally think attack on titan and keeping in mind of my experience on attack on titan i have like very little experience on other things so i'd probably say attack on titan is the best oh yeah just a little bit of bias showing there <laughs> but a um, little bit yeah. yeah but i just think number of okay so in previous tournaments i saw results there was not a lot of attack on titan players this specific tournament had a lot more, right? People mm-hmm. choosing a talent Titan as one of their three. Um, am I correct to say that, or is that not accurate? I'm not sure, because they, they haven't released the numbers, and I think we o- we played two AOT players, but one of them we played twice, right? Was that right, Dean? Dean played all the AOT. Mm, uh, I only played against uh, Tom and Connor. Oh, yeah, those two were on AOT. I know, I think it was uh, the New York Regional, AOT was the highest at 11%, which... Yeah, I yeah. played against like three or four AOT matches in New York, I think. Yeah, I think my opinion of AOT is a little controversial compared to everyone else. I really think it's not as good as everyone thinks it is. Um, but I don't fault anyone for playing it or thinking it's the best deck, because it is still really a really powerful deck. But I, but yeah, I'm, I'm surprised even for New York, if like people were going in trying to win the whole thing, I'm surprised how little AOT there was. I figured it would be at least like almost 20%, but I guess people are sick of it or not looking to have the absolute best team, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, one one important thing that I guess lends the AOT being a good pick for teams uh, is that with Move Gear, I think I th- with Move Gear, basically you have eight copies of every card that you play four of in your deck get them but like functionally you have eight and that's just a very consistent deck that take to a team tournament you really want decks that can just win the game so you don't have to worry about them i think that lends to it being like a favorable choice ever have those bad bang dream games where you like don't draw the gate and it's really awful <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's a good deck or your four costumes are in the last third of your deck I'm sorry, man. That was a- <laughs> <laughs> Deserved easily. So much, you literally become the anime. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. All right. That was, that's a pretty cool discussion. Um, I guess we'll just move on to Review Starlight. Um, I guess since you played it in Texas, UA, you want to kind of lead us on your thoughts of Review Starlight and we'll go from there? Um, so. I own a store, and it's very easy for me to get uh, really fast, right? Two, two TDs, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so, so some people thought that I played two TDs. Like, this was like almost mono yellow. This guy in the room, and he's like, yo, did you hear two TDs won the event? And I'm like, uh... <laughs> 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 I literally did not have any TD cards in there because I didn't want to... Um... So as for the event, so I think when people, I always like playing the newest deck at a tournament. The cards, right? They're reading my cards. Uh, they don't know how to play around my finisher, which is already hard to play around. First combo level one. Um, in theory, really beneficial to play something brand new, right? Yeah. Uh, as for the deck's actual strength, I don't think I would take it to a singles tournament played the deck. My deck was very built to cheese good players in top eight. And it got the job done, right? <laughs> I mean, unfortunately, it didn't even matter, because I think Tom and Alex were just really good all day. Yeah. 
uh, I don't think Review is a top contender deck, unfortunately. Deck. Maybe there's a different build that makes it a really powerful deck, but not the one I play. Yeah. Um, really quick, you didn't play the changes into the 3-2, uh, I forget her name, but the yellow level th 3 finisher, right? Kauriko, I think. Yeah, Kauriko. Yeah, so I played this 2-1 that is a 2-soul beater instead. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't want to play a card that... Uh, like super streamlined. I didn't want to play any cards that required me to think. <laughs> that might be like okay. <laughs> understand. I just want to play cards that I can play down, and they can, they just have an on play impact and no, no like interaction with anything else. It makes it very easy for me to play a deck that I barely got any testing on. Um, is intended to just be very consistent at rushing soul, right? So the changer I think is really good, and in standby you can call out the grade three. Level three, sorry, at level one, which is kind of strong. Card's good. Uh, I didn't play because it it's too complicated for me to think about. Okay. Uh, yeah, personally, I really like that changer. You can do some really wacky stuff with it uh, that other cards don't allow you because you can force your opponent to discard hand when you change, which I think is pretty funny sometimes. And then, um, I'm sorry. Pretty cool. I didn't realize that works. Yeah, yeah, that's actually pretty sick. Yeah, which when I, when I was playtesting the deck, that's what I would like try to go for because you're not winning board with this deck. You're just setting up your hand for level three, so you're like basically playing a combo deck for the most part. And so your opponent should always have like basically a full hand. And then when you get like double or triple change off, um, it gets really funny when like you bounce all that stuff to their hand, and you're like, all right, now you got to discard three because you have ten cards in hand. And then uh, you know you just swing in for the empty. Like the four four four, and you just kill them from there. And it's uh, so, um, speaking on that, uh, I didn't. I obviously it's a new set. I didn't play review in Japanese. I didn't realize the interaction. Uh, because of how it's timed, it's like pretty nice. Because even if you don't combo on the turn after you change, uh, you bet basically have to swing open lanes. So for my soul rush strategy, nice as well. I just didn't. It didn't occur to me. Uh, it's a good card. It's really good. I think. Play it. Yeah, um, so I guess we'll just. I played mostly the yellow deck. Uh, I think in English, you're either probably going to play like maybe eight gates, standby gate, or like the mono yellow deck for the most part, with like splash whatever other colors you want. Um, but yeah, I think I agree with you for the most part. I think the set's kind of like in that tier two slash A tier type of thing going on. Like, it has, like, a lot of potential, but it's, like, just missing a lot of stuff. But, I mean, in Japanese, they announced the second set, so hopes is that the second set does get released in English. A Suba treatment, man. Like, a Suba treatment. Oh, yeah, for sure. That'd be really good. Get a couple weird broken cards, like, Foreclosure and uh, Aqua Free Fresh. Or not Free Fresh, uh, Re you know, Fumio or whatever. Um, but, yeah... What do you guys think, uh, Dean and Nico? I, I've only played against it a couple times. I think it's, um... I mean, it's got, like, the really beefy cards in the center that gain soul, right? I mean, that, those seem, like, pretty solid. But, like, I don't know about, like, the overall set well enough to, um, really comment on its meta viability. I haven't, like, dug into it. I don't care about idols. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the team were like two idol sets, and then Disgaea. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I played Bane during all throughout the dude. season too, but it's like I, I don't know. Like, like uh, Vice isn't a game where you have to care about every set, thankfully. <laughs> so I, I can just ignore things that like the IPs don't interest me. What about you, Nico? Yeah, uh, I think I'm pretty much in the same boat. The set's all right. Uh, it's definitely got the potential to win, but like outside of those like big beefy cards in the center that swing for two every turn, like you have a what a fairly generic climax combo that's what seven k on attack or something. Yeah, that's basically Shimakaze. Yeah, that's pretty whatever in English. English players don't play around anything. <laughs> I'm just being honest. One yeah. thing, uh, one thing I really well, like. 
that the set has going for it though at least the yellow build because that's what i kind of play tested the most out of all the builds is definitely if your opponent's game plan is to dump out a lot of the level threes early on you just kind of tell them to get the hell out and you just yeah. bounce all their shit back to their hand with or or they're forced to side attack your changers which is always really weird when someone does that i'm like okay side attack a level two for zero yeah <laughs> deal zero damage that turn yeah that seems pretty good yeah but yeah, it's just kind of whatever. Uh, I don't think it's going to be a top contender, but who knows? I could be proven wrong. Maybe yeah. there is a maybe there's a really busted build with like the eight gates or something, as you said in English. But I just kind of don't see it. Yeah. Well, I mean, the one thing that I really like about yellow is obviously the level three finisher in yellow is just so powerful. Yeah, that card's stupid. Yeah, you get to dodge like counter steps and stuff like that, and remove per people's board and not care. So. Mm. Yeah, so if anyone's playing Arissa Wall, they get really sad. It's okay, that deck sucks. <laughs> I think the, the, main, the one big deck that like this deck just stomps on is like that Arisa minus two soul deck. And I guess how soccer decks have minus two soul. It just feels so free. Yeah. yeah. You bounce so it off. Probably... Go ahead. No, yeah, and like I think people who try to like try field level threes on, on GGO and you just like literally bounce their entire hand back to them and you just like get to get this garbage out of here is pretty funny <laughs> too um but yeah you guys have any other like last thoughts on revy starlight take eh. that yeah i can take that silence as it's a no just eh. <laughs> yeah see so what you guys think it'd be like around a tier or tier two or whatever i put it low a high b okay yeah similar yeah i can agree with that all right, so on to a more juicier topic for us all, I guess. It's going to be how to become a good player. Or, like, I guess the the traits of, like, a really good player. Um, like, a lot of this stuff we're probably going to talk about here is just things that can transfer over to, like, any game for the most part. I'm sure I've heard Yue say this before, too. So, I guess um, one thing that I think we all do here as, like, quote-unquote good players at the game, except for Yue, who's the best player, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yo, oh my god, I'm gonna sound so cocky. I just realized. Like, I don't know if my joking tone comes out. Well, it's like half joke. But... <laughs> no, I get you. I get you. But um, I think one thing we all do here um uh, that like kind of I would say separate us from a lot of other players is that when we win or lose, I I guess you would tell me if you agree with this. Whether we win or lose. We're always looking back at the game and seeing what we could have done better, or why we lost, or where did like at what point did we give up tempo or whatever that caused us to lose or win the game, and understanding why we won or lost. Whereas I think some oh, yeah. a lot of other players will just be like, "Wow, I got unlucky and drew six climaxes." <clears throat> Nico, um, <laughs> 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 but uh, but yeah, is that, is that something you can agree with, Ua? Yeah, I mean, definitely. You're, you're speaking of like mentality or like, like I, I mean, I agree with them in both factors. Mm -hmm. I totally agree, like, 100%. Um, uh, I think I know when they're like, like, quote unquote, dying super hard, like, true six climaxes. Like, there's a temperament about them. Like, Nico, I think Nico was pretty good, by the way. But one thing that I think probably. To me, he was out a lot. Was his like how he was reacting to the situation, uh, and I think uh, had he not, it might have changed some things on my, some of my decisions. Right, like uh, the best players that they're out like six probably won't show you that they're out six. That's a big one. Like even well, if they're out four in the wait, wait, what's up? Nah, I just wanted to like kind of make a thing. It's I agree with you. Temperament's a big thing, and like telegraphing certain things. But I think. Yeah, you're right. I probably could have kept or been a little more quiet, but I think you also would have had an idea my hand wasn't that great because I think what I ditched a gate in a pants like first turn. So I'm already <laughs> telegraphing I have another gate in hand. So you already know I'm kind of out a lot. And then I have to clock a pants. What is it? I cancel damage on the first attack and then I have to clock a pants. So then you already see I'm like out four. So yeah, it's just. I agree, temperament's one thing, but I figure at that point it's like, I'm already, it's not that I'm telegraphing anything. I, like, you, if you're a decent enough player, you can already kind of tell I'm already out quite a bit of climaxes, and it's act, like my, the first turn I could actually play the game. 
for sure. I hundred yeah. percent agree. Like I, I knew you were out a lot. Um, um, I kind of did know. Yeah, like straight up, you did. Like you said, you ditched the gate already, which means you have a gate. Um, the ball for the earlier rounds. You know, when you play against players that are might be newer, less experienced. For I me, mean, I'm sure you do. Uh, <laughs> have you seen really? Nico play? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a road fest, but... <laughs> I think in my opponent in top 8, I straight up told him to stop at one point. <laughs> you told him to fucking stop, and it was like turn 2. <laughs> this was this was after, what, two shots of vodka, and then overcharging you for the vodka <laughs> before oh, top yeah. 8? We had, we had a shot of vodka, they overcharged us for the vodka, they took like 20 minutes with our checks, so we had to sprint, but, well not sprint, but we had to like hurry back we, upstairs or else there was, well, it was me and to. Broderick. Because oh. <laughs> Broderick also had to play his top eight game at that time, so yeah. You guys were a bit tipsy during top eight. Uh, Absolutely not. Only Nico. <laughs> <laughs> well, that makes my uh. Oh, I, mean, I feel even worse. I feel really bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, yeah, that's like another thing too. Um, I talk about this a lot with N uh, Nico and Dean about telegraphing things through discards and stuff like that. And like bad players will just, you don't even have to like telegraph crap. You can just like ignore it because bad players won't look at your waiting room. They won't like look at what you discarded really and stuff like that. So certain players you can get away with other things, but um, like good players, um, you know, if they discard a climax that they obviously need at level one, the assumption then is that they already have another copy in their hand and their hand is just bad enough that they can't hold on to it and discard it later to like fake that they still have stuff in their deck. Yeah. Well, there's also more than just like telegraphing. There's also like the mentality at the end of the day. Uh, like you, you said, uh, the thinking about games, but like you, you've seen it like every time like I lose a game, I try to point at something that I did wrong. Winning, I think it's like really hard to like point to winning in this game because like sometimes your opponent just eats garbage like that they shouldn't. Like they'll be like, you know, like one and three and you'll stick like six damage out of nowhere. But, like, uh, most losses you can attribute to, like, a point in the game where you did something that was suboptimal. Yeah. I think. Yeah. And I, I think, like, uh, th that's where, like, a lot of people, like, fail at uh, getting better. It's just they don't, um, they don't try to learn from those moments. Yeah, just having the mentality to want to learn and figure out exactly why is, like, such a big stepping stone in, like, any competitive game. Whereas once you get past the emotionalness of winning and losing and realizing that's like doesn't mean crap and it's all about actually coming from every game to just get better and better, uh, then that's like a really big growing step for a lot of players. And then from that point, usually a lot of players get better way quicker. I but, agree. Yeah. I just totally agree. Uh, in agreement... But yeah. what do you guys I mean, because like there was, there there was the game against uh, UA knows this where like I was denied top in uh, Toronto last year, and I was out eight on like turn two, but then I still pointed to a misplay in that game, like despite the fact that I was playing with like a zero card hand, uh, like the entire game because I'm playing Persona, which relies on gate triggers and hitting brainstorms to maintain hand, and like as like terrible as it was. I still point to like a misplay in in a game that that was that far gone, um, where I was left with a four card deck with two climaxes, and I should have just like double triggered and then salvaged, and then uh, pay three encore, and instead I like brainstormed, which gave me a really garbage refresh, uh, because the hand I had now versus the hand I got then was like, it was the same. It was like the same. Like it would have been the same card quality. The only thing that changed was my refresh. Yes. Um, Good. So, uh, the one thing, like, okay, so, like, I totally agree with you guys. The one thing that sometimes I see is when, like, people who are better, this is from a friend of mine's perspective, like, sometimes uh, when you go to their locals, you know, a lot of people are trying to have fun, uh, and they're not trying to have that competitive mindset. And then, ask, you know, when you try to talk about your games after you lost, try to talk about plays or maybe your opponents misplays your misplays that's like one shortcoming of like 
being a good player and like you'll often be treated kind of like being really serious or kind of like so my friend doesn't go to locals anymore because of that uh mm. i i it's really a, it's a real pleasure getting to talk with other good players at regionals after a loss talk about plays and stuff but definitely like at a local scene you can get kind of pushed out a little bit if you know what i mean i don't know what happens over there i'm at I kind of, we talk about plays, but like at the same time, like when I go into a locals, like I'm there to meme as hard as possible. Yeah, no one really plays like the super, super serious decks a lot of the time. And if you do, you get bullied. So. <laughs> <laughs> I come in there with freaking Goblin Slayer. Everybody's like, oh my God, this fucking guy is such a tryhard, all this other crap. So <laughs> <laughs> we do do that. Yeah. <laughs> I think, um, one thing at least that uh, helps a lot is outside of like locals, at least for us, since we've kind of, all kind of like found each other, uh, that we all realize that we're good players and stuff. We spend a lot of time outside of our locals talking about the game, whether it's through Discord or something, and like showing each other's deck lists and breaking down why certain cards are in there, at what quantities, and things like that. Um, which necessarily doesn't, uh, having a good deck quality doesn't necessarily always make you a good player. But, uh, I mean, just having that uh, support group, basically, to that you're all looking to achieve the same goal of just becoming better players at the game and and all that is is really, really awesome. Like, in Southern California, unfortunately, I like, four years ago or so, I moved away from Southern California. And Southern California has, like, one of the best English and Japanese white scenes, I think, in all of America. It, there's just, like, they like launch like 30 man locals like every week well not every week but if we've got 30 people it's not like a surprise that we have that many people at our locals and uh, usually a good good amount of them are people there that are want to be competitive and want to be the best and so you can um, get those like quality discussions with those types of players but i'm not sure how your locals are ua from what it sounds like is kind of like what we have where there's like only like 10 people kind of show up consistently or whatever and everyone kind of just uh plays whatever they want for that week yeah we have like a fairly large turnout for the tournaments that we have in bc mm-hmm. but like i do think the other flip side is tr- like 100 percent true it's a more uh locals they're there to have fun and when it gets too competitive it gets very awkward sometimes um we try to you know be less like that that we tell people like if you're really competitive just keep it to yourself then because like they end up getting bullied, they end up not having fun, and it just gets worse for everyone. Yeah. Your opponent feels like you're playing with an ass. A good player is like, sometimes if you can't have a good network in your region or in your area to talk to, like a lot of the best players I know that have pretty bad locals, they say, end up just talking online, like we're doing now um, on the discords. It's kind of an advertisement for Discord, but I definitely think. That's where you can find some good players, okay? I don't want (laughs) to... We can find some good players. Not everyone's good on Discord, but there are good players there online. You can find pretty good players. Um, You guys completely disagree. Maybe you guys think Discord's filled with No. I can agree with you, but man, sometimes some of the discussions they have in there are so whack. That I have like, holy crap, are these guys playing a different game than us? Yes. <laughs> it's, it's like, I feel like, um, I feel like some of the best voices, because like, I believe that like, you removed yourself from uh, the most active Discord, correct? UA? Yes. Yes. And then uh, Alex Paddywagon did as well. I, I believe that like, once those two voices of reason were gone, it's, um, the the most vocal people are like some of the most questionable players. So, um, but but there are there are other discords that are less active. But uh, so like that that's like a downside. But I feel like you get better quality from them. So yeah, personally, like I almost don't don't even talk in Discord anymore when it comes to like these types of discussions i just kind of keep it within our group and like anyone who else asks like riaz asks me occasionally for stuff like that and I'll, I'll talk to him and stuff on facebook or through discord and stuff but i any of those really big open discussions usually i try to just like read them and then just like not contribute anything to them because usually 
whatever they have to say. Sometimes it's usually like complete opposite of what I have, and I don't have the energy to like argue with these people. <laughs> hard to argue online. It's like really hard. Yeah. Like it's like almost it's impossible to argue while typing. <laughs> with like ten other people typing at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, why do you think people will act like that, though? You think it's kind of like local, what's the word for it, like confirmation bias? Since they're surrounded I, by people with like the same type of mentality, it kind of creates like, well, I, an echo I, chamber of some sort? I think this game is, um, because it's so abstract, like if you play Yu-Gi-Oh! or Pokemon, right? Or like any other card game, it's like the game is very like rigid in its structure. And you can like, uh, while playing, like because the cards just tell you what they do, there's no, like, deeper thought. Like, past, like, was your flow chart correct? Uh, well, in Vice, because it's so statistics-based, um, it, it's, it's like, a lot harder to, like, wrap your mind around, like, where the misplays happen. And so I think it leads to a lot of playgroups just being uh, not very, like, good at the game. Because, like, they'll they'll know how to, like, move cards around on the board, but they won't, like, realize optimal play. Yeah, I, I can actually totally agree with that. Because um, this might, like, I think we talked about this earlier um, between us. Uh, I came from Magic. Like, I originally played Magic was my first card game. And then I played Yu-Gi-Oh for a little bit. Then I went back to Magic. And then I played this. And... Um, seeing players come from like Yu-Gi-Oh and other card games into this, I feel like they see things completely different than how I see it. And so, like I think we talked about this before, because you know, um, like Yu-Gi-Oh players, a lot of their resources just literally their hand. And whereas in uh, Magic, like I can get used to playing like a three-card hand and not have to worry because the three cards in my hand are very high quality. So like sometimes, like for example, with Sunshine. Uh, I will go down to like a three card hand for like five or six turns in a, or whatever, and it wouldn't it will, doesn't phase me because those three cards in my hand are such high quality cards that impact the game so much. Where whereas like I don't know like I I think this is mostly coming from the mentality like a lot of people really advocate at least in Discord you know the whole like tri field turn two slam that climax baby. I, I don't know I feel like they just see the game completely different than how I see it. Wow. Well. I mean, I feel like, so there were some very vocal pillars of the community that really advocated for Trifield. I think they did a very poor job explaining the advantages of doing so. They just took it the wrong way and started doing it like kind of mindlessly. I guess that's, that's another thing about like being a good player is actually like think about what you read online and like kind of dissect it a little more. Uh, it's actually when I hear people just say, "Oh, it's trifield." It's like everyone says it's trifield. It's like trifield. Sometimes when I'm playing a matchup where I want to hit two first. Trifielding is really bad because then your opponent's hitting two first most likely, and then like for example, Rezero versus GGO. If you hit whoever hits two first gets the play down early plays and represent anti change, and it's like a really big deal. But then people just trifield aimlessly anyways in that matchup, and then that is when your opponent hits two first. They get to stabilize and represent anti change. So. That's uh, pretty bad. Uh, yeah, just gotta think. You gotta think about what people are telling you. Think about it a little more. Yeah. Are you telling people to be good players? <laughs> I, I just want you to know, in my New York run, I was apparently the only individual. Uh, this was round six. We played against Riaz's team. I was apparently the only individual who asked him all day how many climaxes went back for his refresh. So, uh... <sighs> That's pretty. That was pretty spooky. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, in my experience, when you ask about that information, they end up telling you the wrong number. Oh. Get... <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, free wins, baby. <laughs> no, I... Jokes, jokes. No, no, I, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Oh, um... Joda, Joda. <laughs> Another big thing I think a lot of uh, good players can recognize, um, especially when they start getting better at the game, which I think a lot of other players don't. Uh, you kind of like touched on this, but you didn't necessarily, necessarily say it this way, um, UA. But like tempo in this game is a thing, and some people don't understand what te the tempo is in the game and what kind of tempo you want to set for the match. 
like try fielding early on you now have made like increase the tempo of the game you're making the game um last usually a shorter amount of time a shorter amount of turns and so sometimes uh people will play with this like crazy tempo it with a deck that they obviously shouldn't be playing that quickly it should you should try to force the game to go as slow as possible in some cases and of course other games like like for example your review list obviously you want the game to be over as soon as possible by catching your opponent with that one misstep and like swinging in for like three 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 or whatever right um i think a lot of people don't see that that often uh, with with their deck they just kind of build the deck because this is what people say or this is the list they saw that won and then they don't, don't really think about how the deck should actually play out every game and every matchup yeah absolutely i i always wanted to try field if i had the cards and i played so many cards in my deck that helped with that line of play it just puts me in a, if opponent basically getting that extra damage lead my me and my opponent refreshes one less time and can be less like I can attack in deck states where they're less compressed is what the key there. Um, no, I hundred percent agree with you. Like some decks that want to play an early play grinding strategy might want the game to go a little bit longer, especially when your early plays are really strong and like let's say, yo, it gets like a fourth attack in every turn. Mm -hmm. I mean, the game when you guys are playing a slow game, so. I 100% agree with you. I 100% agree with you. Which is kind of awkward because now we're just four people agreeing with each other. So maybe I shouldn't oh. agree with you. You're wrong. <laughs> oh, you're breaking my heart, man. <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna start telling everyone is wrong. To mix it up. Right. No, but right. But, uh, yeah, so what about you two, Nico, Dean? Like, what are some things, like, outside of necessarily the game that, like, mindsets or stuff like that that you, you feel like people are missing because they're not seeing the bigger picture, I guess is the best way to put it. I think we kind of hit everything. Yeah. Yeah. Like just yeah. not, <laughs> just like not reflecting on games. RNG, LOL, stupid attack game. Yeah. I really hate when people, uh, who play the game a lot and they still talk about RNG. Me. Like, <laughs> Yeah, well, mostly Dean is who I hate the most. But um, players who won't account for everything and they just assume the RNG just totally screwed them over this time. Yeah. yeah. Those those are the ones that hurt the most. It does feel really bad, though, when you're just... when uh, This is coming from me making a bad play in round one in Texas where you're just like, there's no actual way I get punished here. And then he draws, like, the one outer and you're like, damn. But even then, like you point to a mistake you made in the game where you could have presented potential lethal and uh, you just didn't because you're a pussy. Yeah. And like I said, this comes back again to like having, uh, I guess, a good support group or a good group, you know, we're all have the same idea. We want to win a lot. Like when you lost that round, round one thing, the first thing we did was talk to each other about why you lost that game. Like we, like after we said like GG's and stuff and went, went our separate ways, uh, I, I forgot. I think Dean was there too. So we, all three of us just talked about your game and like why we thought you lost or why, well, like what plays you could have made better from like what we saw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of other players are like, "Lol, I won," or "Lol, I lost," and then they just like walk away and never think about it again. Um, I guess one final thing to talk about, like becoming a good player, is just learning how to sequence, uh, sequence things in a certain order to give you the highest percent chance of being able to hit what you want. I think you, you, you played Pokemon for a while, right? Or do you still play? I still play, yeah. Okay, yeah. There, there was like about a month or so where I thought I was going to start playing Pokemon instead of Weiss because I was getting really sick of Weiss. So I bought a deck and everything, and then I found out a lot of people actually cheat in Pokemon, which really, really upsets me. But um, that's a whole other story. Um, but in that game, like, sequencing absolutely matters. Like, the, you can tell in Pokemon a good player versus a bad player on how they sequence their items and when they use their supports and everything like that. Um, you know, they, they go for that, if it gives them a 0.5% chance more to be able to draw the item they need to be able to, like, win the game, then th they'll make that play. Whereas other players will just play cards, um, like, whatever order, and they'd be like, darn, I didn't hit it. This sucks. Draw clock brainstorm, baby. Who cares <laughs> if you can have a six-card brainstorm? Nah, dude. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, sequencing. Uh, I think sequencing is one of those things, like, 
it's important, super important. It really you, it shows you who's good, who's bad. There is the thing about like you know how people go like, oh, bad player, but gets rewarded anyways for bad plays. Uh, Pokemon and Waze, to be honest, are very forgiving. Uh, they're very forgiving. Yeah. Yeah, I, with, you know? yeah I absolutely <laughs> agree. That's the reason why, like, when I first played Pokemon, I was like, wow, this is so much like Weiss when I'm playing it, what it felt like. That was like, like I feel like almost everything I've ever learned from, like, Weiss and, and Magic as well as far as tempo and stuff like that and sequencing, like, all work very well in the Pokemon TCG. And that, that's why at one point I was literally about to drop Weiss for Pokemon. But, uh, oh. yeah. Being rewarded for... Yeah, so sequencing well gives competitive players an edge, but they're very forgiving games. Um, <laughs> which I guess was what is part of what makes them so fun for people. Because your missequencing can be so forgiving, like, it doesn't actually kill you a lot of the time. People just love the game. It's so... But, of course, the good players have such a high edge because they know... All right, I'm gonna top check. I'm gonna brainstorm after to get that five card brainstorm, or like you know, all those lines of plays people make. I'm gonna play a top check too, and then add dish. Oh, there was this play I made that was really sick where I double Kawaruko when I only had one in hand because I sequenced cards in a way where I was able to peel top card, see Kawaruko, play add dish, add Kawaruko. So like stuff like that. Only single finisher, maybe I wouldn't have won that game. It's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, those little increments of like advantage that you gain over time is just so important. It's usually why, like, um, I usually think the longer a game goes on, usually the better player wins. Like, I think like nine, time out of, nine times out of ten or whatever, for the most part. Maybe not that much in Weiss, but definitely I think it, it, if you go for a very long game, usually the better player gets the opportunity to make more good plays so they get that small advantage just builds up all, so much over time. Of course, if you're playing a little rush deck or something like that, yeah, um, playing a longer game is not supposed to be your, in your game plan, but generally, that's at least that's my school of thought when it comes to it. Sure, for sure. I'm speaking like the rush deck that tried to make the game short, but I totally agree with you. But I, I try to keep the game short so that good players don't have a time to respond. Like, I guess that perfectly in, in line with what you're saying because I didn't want good players to have more time. I just wanted to end them and not think too much about the game. So, you know, you're right. I agree. <laughs> yeah. All right. Sound like such a, I sound like such a noob going like, yeah, I'm just trying to rush people and die. But, like, you know, sometimes when you're playing teams, that's actually what you're looking for. No, yeah. You know? Actually, I think it's a really good skill to be able to play aggro very well. And in every card game, for the most part, I've ever played – uh, like their bad players will play aggro and they'll win some, lose some. But good players who play aggro just are so good at recognizing certain things uh, in the game states that like they know they have to like for, like bolt the bird or whatever just to make sure. Like it feels like you're wasting cards, but in actuality, like you know, trading two cards for one card will actually win you the game because you you know exactly how not to make any mistakes because aggro usually requires you to make the least amount of mistakes possible to be able to win games against good players. Do you bolt the bird? Yeah. <laughs> Always. Real quick. Always. Dude, I played control and combo. That's, that's like all I ever played. Um, You're playing auto red. Do you bolt the bird? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You just bolt yourself, actually, to show dominance <laughs> over that bird. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> All right. Let's move in over. Unless you guys have anything else to add to this, um, we can move into the more super, super spicy topic of English exclusives. Oh, my God. Sure. <laughs> How about that Gurren combo, though? Oh, my God. <laughs> Gurren 2.0. I love it. Um, so you good, Yue, right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, so I guess we'll just go ahead and talk about the English exclusives and how uh, I don't even know like where to start. Um, I guess yeah. I'll give you a brief history for anyone that has recently joined Weiss or anything like that or d isn't doesn't realize this. So technically, the first English exclusive is what we'll call it, whatever that means to Bushiroad, was Attack on Titan. They announced that a really long time ago that this would be the English exclusive, and then it turned into it's just being released a month early in English than Japan, and that really like turned everyone off. 
and then later down the line, well, what, like two years later is when they was Card Captain Sakura? Yeah, was, Card Captain. Yeah, Card Captain Sakura got announced as an English exclusive, and for a very long time, people were buying into that Card Captor is actually going to be an English English exclusive. And towards the end, I was like, oh, sh- maybe it's actually going to happen this time because Card Captor is a hard IP to get a hold of in Japan, and I think another card game at the time had the IP for it. So Bushiroad couldn't like get the licensing rights or whatever, but it's a lot easier to do it in America and like other Western countries. Uh, but then, to our surprise, like w- when did they announce the Japanese one? Was it like literally right after the English release or right before? It was like I think it was like a month, month after it got announced, right? It was like it was before, before it released. Before release. It was about a month yeah. before the English release is when they announced it. I want to say. Okay. Yeah. Um, they announced it, and the set's going to have completely different effects and stuff, so English <laughs> is still <laughs> exclusive, uh, because our, our effects are different. Um, I don't even think they're really changing the art. Uh, I asked Connor and, in another chat group, and he doesn't believe they ever announced that there was art changes. I, I, for some reason, I thought they did, but I guess not. Uh, I guess we'll see when once they release more cards. Um, but yeah, and then now they've announced another exclusive. It was at Worlds this year. Uh, they announced Ninja Batman as an exclusive. And a lot of people were hype. Other people aren't for whatever reason. Some people just really love anime and they hate Western stuff. Uh, but Ooh, myself, It's very anime. <laughs> yeah, it's very anime. <laughs> it is very anime, though. Uh, personally, I, I, re- I really like that they were able to get that IP and bring it to Weiss. I think it'll be a lot of fun and introduce new players that were never interested in Weiss to begin with. Um... But yeah, they finally started like revealing more cards from the set, and uh, between the two quote unquote exclusive sets right now, uh, Card Captain Sakura for the most part felt like a kind of like a total flop. Um, Nico Nico said this I think is like sets. It feels like a set out of 2014, 2015, or something like that, right? Yeah. Yeah, and then now the the cards they've so far shared with us for Ninja Batman have been very lackluster and also it's starting to look like literally Gurren Login with a new skin. It's the new skin DLC, I guess. <laughs> it's in blue this time, dude. Oh, the card's man. blue. You're right. And it's on a like, pants trigger so you don't have to worry about drawing it. <laughs> like Like it like you said like the older type sets. I think that's important because um if you if you look at like a lot of at least a lot of the new sets that I've bought into, uh, which are within the last couple of years, Kimono Friends, ReZero, um, even Steins Gate, which I hate, uh, and Bang Dream, these are all like sets that have a like a pool of good card, like because uh, like you look at older sets and they just printed a lot of bad cards, and they they had like a shoehorn deck that they were like you play this. But I felt like um, in, in most recent years, they've like general card quality has been upped, so it's like sets are more ambiguous with how you like uh, build them. Like uh, because like almost all of the cards are actually good. Like like there's like not as many broken cards, like in the past where they would be like, well, this one card is like carrying the entire set. It's just like the set's just a bunch of good stuff. Um. And then when you look at a set like Card Captor Sakura, it's like it's back to the old formula of like here's like a couple cards that are cool, and then like the rest of this is just hot garbage. Like like you know that this is below the power line for the game. So, uh, I it's messed up because I feel like R and D for in like Singapore or whatever, and I'm not trying to roast like my company's built off of. These games, like Bushiro games, but like I feel like the waste R and D is probably the only game where the people are actually bad at the game. <laughs> a good waste player in waste R and D for English. I just feel like it because you make like announcements and stuff. You can tell like they, they're not even hyping up the right cards. I this, they need better R and D. I don't. I don't think they have good waste is, players. Is this in English or Japanese? In English. No, I think this is English. Yeah. Oh yeah, English. Yeah, then yeah, I I a hundred percent agree. Yeah, I actually wonder if when they decide to make these exclusive sets with exclusive effects and stuff like that, I wonder if they had a completely different team, or maybe it's the same team. And it's actually really crazy. They like look at what's available in English, 
and they just don't know how to build around that because they're so used to building around like what's it out in Japanese. So they they're afraid to give things like uh, like for example, what is it like a Robin card or something, or a Nightwing card that's like tap, give one k if you level up, pay two it's search. It's Z three. It's Z three. Yeah. But it gives five hundred. It just gives yeah. five hundred less power. And like Z three was a good card, but it wasn't like a broken enough card where it had to be nerfed down to. It was on the ban list. Well, uh, yeah, well, that deck had a lot of cards on the ban list. Yeah. Poor contact collection. But it's like a card that I don't think is anywhere near a, near enough to be broken. I know whenever I talk to um, people who work at the western side of Bushiroad, it seems they really do not ever want to release a ban list for Weiss in English at all for all their English stuff. So maybe this is also another reason they like aren't willing to take risks with these exclusive sets maybe but it just feels really really bad i don't i don't know what they're doing the finisher is pretty good i actually think the finisher is really this like it was really exciting when they announced the finisher the finish is like solid cards straight up right it's like wait which, the which finisher the the uh, promo from this this past uh, spring fest the promo from teams i know it's like yeah. it's like oh i actually like the finisher yeah but yeah i agree really, actually since then it's hot trash good cards i don't know but the ones i've seen are hot trash so yeah they have not announced any good cards yet i think yeah the finisher the promo finisher they released for teams uh i think is a really good card but it's like one of those cards that it you need to make it better by like supporting it with other See, effects in the set, but well, the I'm afraid. Also, you have oh, to. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. Go oh ahead. yeah, yeah. I'm afraid they're not going to be able to like release stuff that supports it. It seems like they're just going to be like, yeah, here's the effect. Have fun. No, this could yeah. just be me, but like this effect is is present in Re Zero, and I've never put that into Re Zero, and I think Re Zero has like the weakest level three game of like any set for like oh. finishing games. So um. What I'm hoping for in Batman is that is there is there, is there going to be red in set? I think there is, right? Yeah, there is. That they already showed some red. I'm hoping cards. for a standby. I think standby works wonders with this type of finisher. I think it's really mm. pretty nice. Uh, Rizzo never got a standby, uh, and I think that might actually be the difference, right, because like it's kind of it's ten stock to do triple. I guess. Uh, I guess. But yeah. If you have a standby, but it's like eight stock. If you if you have two of them that came out on two or came out for cheap triple for almost like no stock you can do it for i think start the turn with six play one yeah so it's like i, I would love to stab with these things out at two and they're also 11k so yeah yeah standby standby does make finishers like uh like yeah. it makes it good but like once cheaper. again it's like one of those things like they still haven't revealed a standby and you saw in car captain sakura bringing up standby remember that one zero they showed off the on play gives only 1500 and a climax combo like uh, bounce back to your hand and pay one or something and salvage a card. I was yeah. like, this is for sure on a standby. There's no way this is on anything else. This is such a good card if it's on standby and it's on a fucking gate. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. Like clearly R and D or whoever decided this, they're like, they were so afraid of people stand uh stand buying out the two one change at level one that they they were just like, Yeah, let's just not give the set a standby, we'll just give it another gate. At least Which that's what I feel like. Sad, because I think card cap would have a pretty sick identity. If it got to do this changes at level one, imagine doing the record combo at level one. Yeah. yeah, that'd be cool. Yeah, I think that's just like enough to make the set just actually like really good and playable. Maybe maybe even top tier. You know, I haven't tested it with fake standbys or anything, but it I was. Think I think it'd be top tier, but it would be yeah. like it have its own gimmick. It would be it would be like a gimmick that you would be afraid of. Like if you sat across from that and they like were pooping out records at level one, it would be like, wow, this is pretty cool soundless voice. <laughs> <laughs> and another thing about it, like when I talked to people about this before, they're like, Oh, they're afraid of that. And I'm like, if they're so afraid of it, why do they let this happen all the time in Japanese? Like Symphogear Gear can do it. A lot of other sets have changes that come out early. Bang Dream can do it. Uh, even in English, Bang Dream can do it right now. Bang, oh, his yeah. pastel palettes, strong. Oh yeah, pastel palettes can, <laughs> can actually dump a board of level threes at level one right now, and they can they attack that same turn, which is the best part. Um, but yeah, I I don't know what's going on here with R and D or what they're actually doing. I hope we're all wrong in the end, and Batman is like a really fun set, and we're just giving them shit right now for no reason. I have hopes. I have hopes. Um, 
I, I do have hopes. I think the finisher is really good. I think if you give it some little push, you don't need a lot of cards to make it that good. Um, just being able to think it has potential. I just right at, at this moment I'm getting scared, but I'm not. I haven't given up yet. <laughs> do you okay? So do you actually think that the restand thing is better than like the Batmobile Gurren Logon thing? Uh. I just want a standby, man. I think the resound's better if I get a standby. If I don't, I have to reconsider certain things. Mm. Um, I, I, it's up in the air whether it's better. I just want to. I want to standby this out at two, and I want to do triple. That would that be? That's the dream. Triple six attacks. You're killing people. I think you're killing people, and you're probably clearing the board because it goes to like 14k after the second combo. You say that now, and then you're playing against Sal with uh, Austin to support of the back row. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, there are there are definitely things that if restanders are meta, uh, they can very quickly become unmeta. People will just start taking memory counters. A lot of the sets have. Wait, wait, people don't well, actually tech. We, so we say that, but literally, like the top like one percent of players will be doing that because they they expect to be in top eight and play against this set possibly, but um. Yeah. But yeah, um, English exclusives, man. I just, I hope, yeah, I really hope we're wrong. I hope they keep doing English exclusives. It'd be really cool if this continues. Uh, I just hope they either get the R&D department together or, like, take a little bit more risks. Uh, Sky 5 effects. English exclusive, please. Yeah, the Sky 5 English exclusive. <laughs> oh, man. I'll take any shitty cards. <laughs> yeah. But uh, you guys have anything else to add to the fun English exclusiveness going on? I just don't want anything like Card Captor Sakura. <laughs> if we have like just something slightly better, I'd be I'd be honestly satisfied with like kind of what where Revy Starlight is the high B low A tier instead of like somewhere in the C tier. <laughs> yeah, I mean, man, even during this entire like. Uh, team league stuff going on. Remember every card captain Sakura person I played against, I was just like, I think that deck sucks. And they're like, yeah, after this event, I absolutely agree with you. It's garbage. <laughs> Even the person who got first place in Toronto was like, yeah, this deck is not good. <laughs> and I'm just like, if I'm playing players who are like good enough to like at least or their teams or whatever get get to that point, um, and they're agreeing that it's like doesn't feel like a really good set to play. It just something is going wrong. It's really upsetting. I just want to remind you that you gave Siege the most shit when it came out, but you Look, have the worst record. Let's not talk Siege. about that, dude. We're we're not talking about that. I'm so good at <laughs> I'm so good at getting screwed by Siege. I, I love it. So so now I'm afraid of Siege and I'm afraid of Prism Ilya. I don't want to ever play against those decks. Oh God, Roderick has scarred me for life. <laughs> so so you're talking about people teching for the top tables i actually have a question for that ua because as somebody who's never succeeded in singles <laughs> do you think it's better to tech to get to top eight and then and uh since that there's like more rounds to get through and then you can just vice people in top eight or yeah. do you or do you just tech to win the full th like to win in top eight and assume that the shitters are shitters and you win anyway um this is a good question, actually. Um, so I always assume I make top eight. That's like, hmm. I mean, just already assuming I'm in top eight because, uh, not to brag and boast, but I have a pretty good track record. Of just straight up, you, you go into like a tournament and people play against you, and they play against UA Pay, and you have like this mental like, just straight up. So I just assume I make top eight. You do. You. It's really hard. Yeah, I don't know. I, I just I don't think I've ever not made top eight except for the one tournament I played TLR, which was a big misplay. I didn't sleep the night before, and I, my deck was trash. Um, we don't talk about that tournament. Um, <laughs> my decks always tech for top eight in California. I think the most recent one that I won, uh, my my AOT list was like hard tech for Sunshine. I played nothing. I played against Sunshine, 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 and top eight. So I played two Aaron early plays, so that when they early play, I drop them and I Armin hexproof one full board and then like have my giant board that survives and I can counter step over them to beat every single sunshine player. So 
mm. the best deck and the most represented in top eight. Um, obviously, sometimes, like, I guess, I, I don't know if, if I've ever been punished. Like, decks that have easy answers in top eight, like, you don't want to play an invasive tech, right? Like, an, a very invasive tech is, like, playing meta contact, but instead of playing, like, Prince, you're playing, like, the fleet of the deep sea combo that pops back room. Hey. I, <laughs> I may have a list for that. <laughs> I think that's way too that's invasive. Like I can't play yeah, the game plan I want to play and do that tech. So Aaron or they play it. It's a it substitutes as like the third Mikasa sometimes. Mm -hmm. And it just stonewalls them because it's like it can be like sixteen. But I guess I guess you play AOT, which has, like, very stable game plans against, like, the entire field. While um, Bang Dream is really cool and it's very high variance sometimes. It's it's not even that high variance. It's just, like, the lows are, like, unplayable. <laughs> Don't draw gates. Cast me in the bottom of the deck. Or the stars. Like, not having stars, not having a climax. And then, like, you always surrender board while AOT can, like, bounce back to hand and, like, move gear and stuff. Very solid deck. Yeah, uh, I think. Um, like, I feel like I feel like Bang Dream has to clock draw every turn, which is the biggest downside as a set. Yeah, I just like I love not clocking. When I'm playing a deck, I don't have to clock. It feels really good. It like, saves so much damage. It feels really good. It feels really nice. You say that um, there was a game where I clocked only once in the Mirror of Sunshine, and uh, my opponent clocked like every turn, and I still lost, even though I had seven card hand the entire game. I went to kill myself. <laughs> oh man, I, I love when that stuff happens. But yeah, um, oh. decks like a good advantage. Not having a clock feels so good. But yeah, I think that kind of like wraps up everything. Any any last words from anyone? I guess you know well, since you weighs the guest, let's say your goodbyes you wear unless you have anything else to add uh i just want to congratulate you guys actually i know you guys hit a thousand recently and i never got to like properly congratulate you like, i think that's a really cool milestone for a waste channel oh yeah so, thank uh, you i like i think this is like the big actually the biggest wise channel that's really sad that a thousand uh, subscribers is like the biggest wise channel do you is there any other wise channel that's bigger than this oh, that's accurate. Uh, some of the japanese ones maybe but so I'm really, yeah, I think it's really cool. I, I recently noticed you guys were a thousand, and I was like, damn, that's awesome. So congratulations to you guys. Uh, thank you so uh, much. And, uh, thanks thank for you. the game, even though it was kind of not quality on all three tables. <laughs> <laughs> well, my game uh, my game with Alex was like really good. I think it was really good quality, except the fact that we both kind of dirtled at level one and not combo the entire game. Outside of that, it was a really, I think it was a really good intense match, and I, I enjoyed it. I think that was the first time I played Alex also, so... It was a really good game. Actually, speaking about that too, you know, he was one of the first people to ever actually ask me about my thought process at the end of the game there. And I was like, I was so taken aback by it because um, usually my opponent never does that at like regionals or anything like that. Um, that like, it really made me happy that he, he would do that. And I just explained my entire thought process and why, why a three cost here. And because I thought I could make these certain plays to kind of high roll myself in a good position because I was already in a bad position to begin with. So that was that was really cool. It made me respect Alex a lot more. But yeah, uh, Nico Dean. Shout out to Alex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? Nico Dean, you got <laughs> any good advice up here? <laughs> uh, dude, I I just sat across from Tom for the forever, and he had to see me with literally the most garbage pile of cards I could have. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, man, that was a good first impression of uh, him playing me. Yeah, I, I like I like that. Didn't he say, like, it doesn't matter what my opponent plays? And then you're Well, because it really didn't. Like, yeah. there's a point where I had, like, four climaxes in deck, so I didn't even feel the need to mill. But, like, I ate, like, a level. I ate, like, nine or something. And then and then I brainstorm hit three, and I'm just like... <sighs> I guess... And, and my, my brainstorm just fucking sucks. It's a draw brainstorm, so I'm like... <laughs> That's, this is cool. <laughs> We're having a game. I get to draw things that I can put on the board. It, it's like a very... Uh, Tag on Titan is a really good deck, and um, it, it's very good at punishing really, really old decks. So, 
So like, yeah, I, I felt like it really didn't matter what I was playing. Like, I don't, I don't feel like even if I was playing a different deck, that I would have like panic milled my deck there. <laughs> oh yeah. And then uh, Nico, any last goodbyes? Uh, just hitting on what UA said, like at the start of the uh, little podcast thing. It's uh, try not to telegraph your emotions so much. <laughs> I know uh, I probably didn't uh, succeed very well in that last game, but I figured at that point, UA is also a good enough player to realize how fucked I was in that situation, so I didn't need to maintain a poker face the entire time. Always bluff. Just just stay cocky the entire game. Tell your opponent, I'm not afraid of you. <laughs> just play like Dean, always <laughs> complaining about losing, not stop. <laughs> and then he wins. Dean is winning the game, but he is complaining about losing the game. Hell yeah, every <laughs> time. Happened. <laughs> oh, dude. Oh, man. You, you'll never get the read on Dean because he's too busy crying about everything going on in the game. <laughs> God damn it, I hit three on this brainstorm on first deck. Ah! <laughs> Let me I play only my have four in hand. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, but yeah, uh, thanks everyone. Thanks, UA, for coming on. It was really cool to have you on here finally. I know a long time ago, we when we passed each other in New York, we are uh, we talked about like collabing together, but we finally got around to doing it. Uh, it's really cool. Yeah, and congratulations yeah. on your win in Texas. It was it was really cool playing you guys in the finals. I'm glad. I think like everyone in that top eight was like really high quality players. That's why I'm even more amazed that um, our little team with the Sky made it to second. We were ready to go yeah. too and go get uh, drinks. <laughs> yeah, I was ready. <laughs> All right. Uh, besides that, guys, I hope to see you all in the next video. Later. Before you go, make sure to like and subscribe to our channel if you do enjoy our content as it does help us grow. And check out some of these social media links below.